America Meditating Radio Show. We collect wisdom, inspire each other, and empower hearts 24-7. Hi, I'm Sister Jenna. Join me and guest on Blog Talk Radio as we amplify stories that compel us to be more for ourselves and everyone else around us. The entire world wants. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And humanity saw that the sky was not the limit. Achievement. Pass it on from the Foundation for a Better Life at values.com. Do you like to meditate? Have you tried to meditate? Have you struggled with meditation? Why don't you visit one of the Brahma Kumaris Meditation Center? Visit brahmakumaris.org. Are you in need of a tech service company that's going to deliver the best solutions for your business? Then at Chanaka is your solutions headquarters. Here we specialize in your individual needs to make sure your business shines. For more information, please call 301-417-0070 or visit us at our website at atchanaka.net. At Chanaka, where we deliver for you. Take a break. Breathe. Why don't you visit the Peace Village Learning and Retreat Center? 518-589-5000. The Meditation Museum in Silver Spring, Maryland offers a variety of courses and activities to make your life go a whole lot smoother. Located at 9525 Georgia Avenue, you will be able to experience the beautiful silence that's in the space. There are courses in Raj Yoga Meditation, Positive Thinking, Stress-Free Living, and Personal Development Classes. For more information, call us at 301-588-0144 or visit us online at meditationmuseum.org. Hey everybody, it's John DuParent from Project Forgive. How are you doing? You are in the right place for the highest level of conversation to feed your soul. American Meditating with Sister Jenna. Stay with us.
welcome. This is America Meditating Radio. That was the road least traveled by Lucinda Drayton. So I'm Sister Jenna, and I'm happy that we could meet on a regular basis as we continue with our journey. I've been sharing with you lately about my fascination of the Model 3 Tesla, and I hope you enjoyed listening to that show and my spiritual perspective of how dynamite I think that we're moving where we can actually have a vehicle that cleans the air or doesn't impact the air, quite like all of our other cars. It's growth. It's progress. When we get more towards a place of purity and easiness and lightness, it's a sign of really that we've been doing our work. And so I think this is where I'm really enjoying how science also has a way of marrying the spiritual dimension. As I've been mentioning, I don't know, it's just such an energy. I'm like, whoa, I can't wait for this season to pass. For the last two or maybe three weeks, it's been just a feeling of like something is hovering over you or some vibes or maybe some one or two negative thoughts are coming towards your way or something. And I'm just writing it through and and responding to my best ability because nothing stays forever and everything comes to initiate within you your own personal power. And I believe that with all my heart. And when it comes on power, being healthy feels like always in our hands, but in some way it is. I mean, you can at least exercise, eat well, drink enough water, and you can at least reduce the abilities of being ill. And so I want you to stay tuned because we're going to have Dr. Nicole Avena on the show, and she's going to be talking about her book and her blog, and we're looking forward to having our chit-chat with her. But before I get Dr. Dr. Avina on. Let us go to Sister Gita. Sister Gita, good day to you all and to myself included. I am taking from the Feeling Great book, authored by Daddy Janke, Peter Vexko, and Kelly Johnson, and was aided by the Health Communications Incorporated in good old Miami, Florida. And the keys to feeling great. To inspire means to fill others with enthusiasm, confidence, and creativity. When we are inspired, we feel truly alive. We certainly take in presence and words of exceptional spiritual teachers. The word inspire also means to breathe into, which is about our own responsibility to take advantage of what we hear of the atmosphere and energy around us, and shared wisdom. This was a part by Daddy Janki. Om Shanti, have a feeling great day, full of optimism, enthusiasm, and contentment. Om Shanti. I think now we will. I think that was beautiful. I love Daddy Janki. You know, she was the one that got me on my spiritual path. And at the age of 100, she is four feet, 11 inches of spiritual dynamite. And she's just so full with so much of good in her. And I'm just fortunate to have had someone like that impact my destiny. And I'm looking forward to doing that always over and over again. The America Meditating Radio is pleased to welcome Dr. Nicole Alvina, who is a world-renowned neuroscientist and expert in the fields of nutrition, diet, and addiction. Nicole has written extensively on topics related to food addiction, obesity, and eating disorders, and her research achievements have been honored by awards from several groups, including the New York Academy of Sciences, the American Psychological Association, and the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Dr. Veen is the co-author of Why Diet Fail and author of What to Eat When You're Pregnant. She also maintains a blog called Food Junkie with Psychology Today. Today we welcome Dr. Nicole Avina to the show. Welcome, Dr. Nicole. Oh, thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for joining us. You're a very prominent neuroscientist, and you're pretty much thought out for your expertise in nutrition and eating disorders, which is so huge nowadays. What is it that actually inspired your interest in becoming a neuroscientist? I look at your picture, and if it's an updated picture, you look like 20 (laughs) <laughs> and why, oh. <laughs> did you, um, <laughs> why did you decide to focus on nutrition? That's very kind of you. I, I assure you I'm a little bit older than 20. <laughs> um, well, you know, it's funny. I don't really have a story as to, you know, how I got interested in, in neuroscience and nutrition. I can say that when I was in college, I was doing research in a laboratory, a psychology laboratory, 
because I had, you know, wanted to go to graduate school and I heard from some professors that it's a good idea to get some research experience if you want to go to graduate school. I originally thought I would want to go on to become a therapist and, you know, help people through emotional and psychological problems that they had. And when I started doing research in this particular laboratory, I found it really fascinating that they were studying the brain to try to understand some of these disorders that, you know, therapists would help people through like depression and schizophrenia and things like that. And so that kind of got me interested in the brain and how the brain can really control our behavior and how it is such a critical element of what we do and how it dictates what we think and how we feel in many cases. So that's how I got interested in the brain. And I got interested in nutrition kind of just, I think, coincidentally, I, you know, had been in graduate school and laboratory that was studying the brain and motivated behaviors. And one of the most motivated behaviors we have is eating. And so it seems to be, you know, a really good fit for, you know, trying to understand what happens when we eat and what motivates us to eat and what motivates us to eat in ways that are sometimes unhealthy. So what motivates us to eat? I know that I've often heard about emotional eating. And I have to tell you for about maybe three years, I went on one meal per day with an occasional fruit or vegetable or something or just a snack or a bag of chips or something or or if I had guests and special function then I would have a salad and roll. I am a vegetarian but there was something in me where I just wasn't interested not because I wanted to lose weight because I didn't because I guess because my body might have had like one meal or just a half per day it perhaps maybe was just holding whatever it had in it my meal in the morning would be huge and I remembered sitting in meditation and wondering, why is it that I just didn't have interest in food? And in Indian culture, the big thing is food, you know? And mm-hmm. here I was like, you cannot impress me with food, so please don't cook up a storm. That's not the way you're going to conquer my heart. <laughs> but I went for three years without that, and I was—I still haven't found an answer. I mean, I can go into some spiritual understanding of that, but... I couldn't understand why. Of course, just to tell you, I do eat two meals a day at least now per day. And I've still Mm -hmm. maintained just about the same weight that I did, you know, a few years ago when I was just having one meal a day. But I don't know why. I just wasn't interested. And I have to tell you, it was a very happy time for me. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think it sounds like you were using food in the way that food was meant to be used. I think, you know, you were probably getting enough calories in that big meal that you would have and maybe the small snack you'd have, you know, in between the meal to sustain yourself. And that's your body adapted to that. It'd be great if we could all do that and treat food as energy, which is what it really is. But what's happened, I think, for most people is that food has taken on additional meanings. People are motivated to eat food because it makes them feel good and the food tastes really good. And the way that the present day, you know, processed foods that we tend to, you know, eat a lot of are designed, they activate our brain in ways that make them really, really, really delicious and really, really, really reinforcing in many ways, like what happens with drugs and alcohol. And so Mm -hmm. I think that, Many people are eating not because they need calories, but simply because the food is pleasurable. And so it's fun to eat. It it can make us feel good to eat. And it can be self-medicating. Many people out there who are struggling with, you know, depression, anxiety, or just, you know, maybe not having a good day or just having some stress in their life often turn to food. Food is a legal drug. It's a legal anxiolytic to make us feel better. And so I think that's yeah. what's happening for many people. And that's what the struggle is with obesity and overeating that we're seeing, you know, throughout this country and throughout many parts of the world. Mm-hmm. It has been estimated that over $60 billion a year is spent on the U.S. weight loss industry. That's a lot of money. And that even includes, right, diet books, diet drugs, weight loss surgeries, What are a few of the main reasons why it seems as if the diets aren't working? I knew a lady who did that. I forgot the surgery where you remove the fat and they shrink your stomach. Um, Right. And she still wasn't able to overcome the emotional need for her to eat, and she overate the amount of calories and her stomach exploded, and it was really hard. Well, I think we have to remember that there's sort of the biological reasons why we eat, right? And so, you know, like when people get weight loss surgery, that's addressing the biological component of it. You can make the stomach smaller and thereby there's less food that can fit in it. So 
if we just operated as biological individuals, we would not need to eat a lot of food because our stomachs would be really small. But there's also the emotional and the psychological component of eating. And this is where we start to think about, you know, the types of foods that people eat and how people feel compelled to eat foods that taste delicious. Even if you're not hungry, sometimes people eat food and people want to eat food for other reasons, for the pleasurable reasons associated with the food. So I think that you're right about the diet industry. I mean, we have all these wonderful programs out there and all this public health information telling people, you know, here's what you should eat. And this is the simple diet plan you should follow. Despite that, people really have a hard time sticking to a diet and sticking to a healthy eating plan. That's why I called my book, Why Diets Fail, because I think there's a lot of really great diet programs out there and there's no reason why they shouldn't work and help people lose weight. But the problem is right. they're really difficult to stick to. People will go on a diet and then go off of a diet a couple of days later and then they try a different diet because maybe that diet didn't work for them. And I think that's because we have failed to recognize the fact that many of the foods and many people are actually addicted to food, addicted in the way that, you know, some people can become addicted to drugs and alcohol. And so when you start to look at it through the lens of an addiction and start to see, well, why is it that I can't stop eating cookies? And why is it that even though I told myself I'm not going to have ice cream after dinner anymore, I still do it, then you can start to appreciate how, you know, other types of interventions might work and might help people to lose weight and kind of break free from that addictive type of overeating pattern. Well, let's look at our kids of um, today, and even First Lady Michelle Obama has been trying to push initiatives to reduce obesity with young kids. Mm -hmm. And the congressman, Tim Ryan, who's a very dear friend of ours, he introduced the Salad Bars in Schools Expansion Act to provide salad bars in schools across the country. But despite coaxing and education, many children still prefer to eat unhealthy foods. So what are some of the dangers of obesity in kids into adulthood? You know what I mean? And what are some of the common psychological mistakes that parents are making raising their kids that are not promoting healthy eating habits? Yeah, this is, I think, the most important issue that we're facing because what happens with children and adolescents is that you know, often they can get away with eating unhealthy foods and we don't physically see the effects of it until later on in life when the damage is already done and difficult to reverse. And so if you have, you know, a very active, you know, teenager, you can, you know, maybe they can get away with eating several different types of unhealthy foods in a given week and they're not going to be overweight. They're going to look like a normal healthy teenager. But if you start to really look at, their insides, they're not healthy. And what is worse than that is that they've already been entrained to eat in a way that is very unhealthy. And when they become an adult or, you know, aren't exercising as much as they are when they're, you know, playing football and other sports, that it's going to catch up with them. And those habits and behaviors that they've formed and the preferences for the types of food they've developed are going to be difficult to change. And so mm -hmm. I think that it's very important for parents to address this issue and to try to instill into young people, good, healthy eating patterns. And it's easier said than done. I can attest to this because I have a seven-year-old. And I can tell you that, you know, trying to convince a seven-year-old that it's a lot of fun to eat broccoli and it's not fun to eat jelly beans is a very difficult thing to do. So I think it boils down to really getting kids to understand that the reason why they have to eat what healthy. I got together um, about two years ago with uh, the TED organization, TED Ed, we mm -hmm. put together a educational video that was geared towards school children, and it's called How Sugar Affects the Brain. And it's a five-minute long video, and I encourage your listeners to take a look at it if they have any interest in, you know, sort of seeing how sugar and these highly caloric foods can affect the brain. And it really does explain in an, a very succinct way how this can be damaging later on in life and, you know, how sugars in these high fat foods can really take over our brain and hijack our reward system and cause us to overeat. So I think educational material like that is good for children so they can really understand, you know, this isn't just mom giving me a hard time or mom not wanting me to have fun by not letting me, you know, have ice cream tonight. It's because it's for my health and there's reasons behind it. Mm, I like that. I like that. You know, it's funny because even growing up, I couldn't do milk. And so, you know, when I hear about ice cream and these things, I always go, wow, you know, I've missed ice cream growing up. But even later on, I realized, well, too much milk, milk is actually not so good for your bones. I later find out that it doesn't have the nutrients that you need for your body. Is that true? 
It's true. I mean, there are people who don't drink milk, cow's milk, for various different reasons or other forms of milk for various reasons. And you can still get the nutrition that you can get in cow's milk or other forms of milk from other sources. And so, you know, you're certainly not missing out on anything in life if you can't have milk or don't have milk. There are other sources from which you can get it. And in many cases, the sources are better because it will more directly absorb into your body. Mm -hmm, Wonderful. Now, I know that exercise is a big thing and it's something that I always um, cry about, that I need to be inspired. I'm not overweight, which is a good thing, but I am, you know, getting into my antiquity, which means that (laughs) your body fat (laughs) burns much, much slower than you wish it to. And I've never had a physical practice of exercise. I've been wanting to be inspired. I want somebody to say something in a particular way <laughs> that could just get me off of this seat. So, you know, just for our listeners who might be in my same predicament, a little encouragement to exercise. Do you have any important tips that could inspire us? I can share you with you my inspiration <laughs> of what got me back into exercising. I had a baby nine months ago, I have a nine month old daughter. And after she was about two months old, I decided, you know what, I really need to do something to get control of my life again. Because, you know, having a baby and I have a seven year old daughter as well, it kind of threw us for a loop. And we're just sort of, you know, in this state of life where I feel I felt like I need to do something just for me to get control again. And so I started running. And I started training for a half marathon. And this is something I never thought I would ever do. I never thought I'd run more than two miles. But here I am, and in two weeks, I'm going to run a half marathon. And I've been training, and now I'm in the best shape of my life, better than I was when I was in my 20s. And I just did it for myself. And I just sort of woke up one day and said, you know what, I'm going to do it. And that's how it happened for me. But I think it could be anything. It doesn't have to be a half marathon. It can just be walking. It can be just committing (laughs) to three days a week. I was like, just thinking that that half marathon, forget it. (laughs) But I get it. I get it. It just touched you. You know, it was just something that touched you and you felt it and think maybe all the the cards were stacked up to help you to go, oh, I want to do that marathon. So I'm not going to lose hope. I really am not. I think you shouldn't. And I think it can be something as simple as, you know, just committing to doing it three days a week and walking or, you know, yoga class and just really doing it for yourself and realizing that, you know, you have to make time for yourself because you have to take care of yourself. You're the most important person to you. So it's essential to make sure you do set aside some time in our busy lives to get some exercise and and time to take care of yourself. I like that. You have to find time to take care of yourself. Oh, that just touched me. Thank you. Before I let you go, share with our listeners your favorite life quote that you're living by. And is there any upcoming talks or lectures that you have or a website that we could find you if we'd like to know more about what you're doing? Oh, sure. So my website is www.drnicoleavina.com. And I will be in my next public lecture is going to be actually out in San Francisco. I'll be speaking at the Commonwealth Club on May 9th, open to the public, although I think it does require tickets uh, to be purchased in advance, but you can find out information about that on my website if you're interested. And in terms of a a life quote, wow, you know, I went, I had to do a long run today. This half marathon's coming up. So I had a lot of time to think while I was running nine miles this morning before we had this call. And, you know, the life quote I think I'm going with today is actually kind of cliche, but I think it's appropriate. And I thought of it while I was on the run. It was the Nike slogan to just do it. And I feel like in my life, many times I have to tell myself lately, just do it. Just do it right now. (laughs) And that's what's Mm. getting me through these days. And I think it can apply to many facets of life, not just running, but to parenting, being a wife, being, you know, an academic. Sometimes you just have to do it. Yeah, it does get overwhelming, but the sense that you've got what it takes and even more. So all the very best with everything, everything that you put your hands on. Thank you. Thanks for having me on the show. You're welcome. Take good care. Bye-bye. So just do it. That's it. And yes, there are a lot of different things that are going on inside of us emotionally because if we were to take those diet pills or go on these diets, it would have worked by now. So again, it goes back to really that there's a spiritual need. There is a spiritual uh, awakening that is calling us uh, into that 
paradigm of being and living so that we can be the best of ourselves. I hope you enjoyed my chit-chat with Dr. Avina. Do visit her at Dr. Nicole Avina, A-V-E-N-A dot com if you've got any questions for her and uh, really appreciated her conversation and her energy. Remember, no one can take away your happiness unless you're going to give them permission to do so. And we are here to love each other the same. And so I'd love that we do do that. And um, do visit me on the Huffington Post or Positively Positive for some beautiful update, languaging and conversation and articles. And stay tuned. We're about to launch a new initiative called Meditate the Vote, and we're going to need every one of you involved. We want to keep creating this positive vibrations in our country so that we can implement a positive form of voting as we come up to November. So take care, everyone, and don't forget to tweet us at America Meditate. I'm going to start to amplify a little bit of that presence, even though my friends, which are a few hundred, I only don't know, like maybe 30 on there right now. So still, if you happen to be a follower or a friend or a fan of America Meditating, I'd love to hear from you on my Twitter handle. I love you. Take good care and be well. Here's Wahai Guru by Sanatam Kaur. <laughs> 